Thank you to all those who are here now and thank you for registering and attending the APRU Biodiversity Genomics in the Pacific Rim Challenges and Future Opportunities Symposium hosted by the University of Sydney and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. From where you're all zooming in from around the globe, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Um, just to begin, a little bit of light housekeeping, please ensure your mic is on mute and if you have any questions, utilise the Q&A function um, at the bottom there and questions be, will be read by our co-chairs uh, to the speakers who will in turn answer your questions. Um, we have an amazing lineup of experts who will be presenting today, of whom our co-chairs, Professor Nathan Lowe, Professor of Evolutionary Biology School of Life and Environmental Sciences, Faculty of S Science from the University of Sydney and Associate Professor Jerome Huey from a Director of Biology Programs, School of Life Sciences from the Chinese University of Hong Kong will introduce you, introduce you to. Uh, so without further ado, um, Professor Nathan Lowe will start our symposium today. Professor Lowe. Okay. All right, well, welcome everyone to the Biodiversity Genomics in the Pacific Rim Challenges and Future Opportunities Symposium. I'm Nate Lowe, as Brooke mentioned, and I'll be one of the moderators for this two hour symposium today, along with Jerome Huey from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So today we have people from all over the Pacific Rim gathering virtually, and I want to express our appreciation to those of you who are up very early or very late. So believe it or not, we did not deliberately plan to have the symposium to be comfortably after morning tea. In Sydney, it was more of a weighted midpoint of bearable times for the speakers from the different countries. So today's symposium is an initiative of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, also known as APRU. And APRU is a network of over 60 leading research universities from 19 economies in the Asia Pacific region. And it was set up about 20 years ago. And uh, here are some of the universities you can see around the uh, area. So the main objective of APRU is to collaborate for impact and bring together researchers and key stakeholders to provide solutions to the many challenges that we face in our region. So we're all very aware of the threats to the world's biodiversity. And for this reason, APRU has initiated in partnership with our COHK and UCID, a biodiversity initiative. And this initiative aims to build networks of researchers in the field to enhance sharing of expertise and knowledge, which we hope will uh, contribute to policy and action in the future. So on that note, we set up a very brief and anonymous survey of just four questions. Uh, and you'll see that in the chat, there's a link there, it only take 30 seconds to finish. And we're hoping this will help to establish our network. And we hope you'll get a chance to fill it out over the next hour and a half or so, so we can look at the results during our discussion, discussion session at the end of the symposium. Okay, so to ensure that future generations are able to enjoy and uh, appreciate the amazing biodiversity that's in our region, uh, we're going to need a lot of action from many areas of society, which is guided by innovative and high quality research. So one discipline that we think can make an important contribution to biodiversity preservation is genomics. And we have a wonderful lineup of expert speakers today from eight different countries across the region to talk to you about that. Now, biodiversity genomic research often involves the study of very poorly understood organisms that are hard to collect. And it also involves the analysis of very large data sets. And these factors make it quite challenging in a number of ways. However, through collaboration and sharing of skills, uh, these challenges can be overcome. So, before introducing our first speaker, I want to thank uh, Christina Schoenlieber and Tina Lin from APRU, as well as Brooke Cohoon Leslie and Amy Chan from UCID and CUHK for their roles in setting up uh, APRU's biodiversity initiative and organizing this symposium. And we are very fortunate today to have uh, Professor Harris Lewin to provide us with a mini keynote lecture today. Harris is a distinguished professor of ecology and evolution at UC Davis, where he holds the Robert and Roosevelt. Osborne, Osborne Endowed Chair. Among many 
many significant honors and achievements. He was the founding director of the WM Keck Center for Comparative and Functional Genomics at the University of Illinois back in 1998, uh, when the field was really just in its infancy. And he was also founding director of the Institute for Genomic Biology at that same institution. And Harris was elected to the US National Academy of Sciences in 2012, and is also a foreign member of the Swedish Academy of Agriculture and Forestry. Harris is the chair of the Earth Biogene Project, about which he will talk to us today. It's a very important uh, project, I would say as important as the Human Genome Project. And he's really a pioneer and leader in this field. So ladies and gentlemen, please uh, welcome Harris now. I will stop sharing. Yes, good. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Nathan. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, to the organizers. Uh, Christine and, and Kathy and um, and Brooke uh, for the for the kind invitation. Uh, as mentioned uh, before, I'm actually in uh, Rio de Janeiro today, which is not a Pacific Rim country, but my home institution is the University of California at Davis, which is in a Pacific Rim country. I kind of wish these days that maybe California was a country of its own, but um, but uh, no, it's a state of the United States, and we are uh, Pacific Rim. Country. So today I will represent both the Earth Biogenome Project and the University of California in my, in my comments. Let me just adjust my screen a little bit so I can see everything. And we shall begin. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, at the present time, um, our understanding of life is on Earth is. Um, is really limited. Uh, it's been estimated that there are 12 to 15 million eukaryotic species on Earth, really an unknown number of bacteria and archaea, possibly in the trillions. Uh, to date, only 1.8 million uh, eukaryotic species have been named uh, by, by science, which represents about 10% or less of, of the total. So um, we really don't know uh, all that much uh, about even what's there uh, in terms of uh, naming. And um, much of eukaryotic life today is under threat. Uh, I would say existential threat due to urbanization, pollution, overexploitation, uh, invasive species. And now the greatest threat of all possibly is, uh, is climate change. Of the 137,500 species that were surveyed by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, 38,500 or 28% of all those are, that were assessed have shown dramatic declines in their population size. And, um, and, and we already know that more than 500 species have gone extinct in the last 100 years. This is anywhere between 100 and 1,000 fold greater than what we would expect from the background uh, extinction rate, which is based on, on the fossil record. So it would have taken 10,000 years rather than 100 years if we go by what the background uh, extinct, what the uh, uh, estimated background extinction rate is. Uh, and, and so if this continues and we blow past uh, two and a half degrees uh, Celsius in terms of uh, uh, the average temperatures on the planet, um, it could be that a million species of plants and animals, it's been estimated of, uh, a million species of plants and animals at least will, will become extinct by the end of, of the century. And if <clears throat> these predictions uh, have actually brought about tremendous global efforts uh, then to preserve biodiversity because the loss of a million species would be anticipated to be a likely tipping point, which would lead to eco ecosystem collapse uh, on a global scale. 
which would threaten then political stability of many nations and possibly even the survival of our own species. And the reason for that is because biodiversity provides the basis for ecosystem services that support life on our planet. Services, ecosystem services, such as agriculture and clean water and medicines from nature and regulation of the earth's biogeochemical cycles. And uh, today, um, most of the talks are going to be dealing with biodiversity and biodiversity conservation in the Asia Pacific uh, region. And um, we know that 60%, greater than 60% of the world's population uh, exists in the Asia Pacific region. And this, the Asia Pacific region is also mega diverse and has high endemicity and thus faces uh, major challenges from urbanization and industrialization. Now, one approach that's been proposed that's on the table uh, is uh, the 30-30 by proposal, which is to conserve 30% of uh, terrestrial and ocean habitats by 2030. And that would make 30% of the land uh, uh, and the oceans off limits to human activities. Now, whether you uh, agree or not that this is a practical solution, it would certainly help to preserve a large amount of biodiversity, but um, it will not preserve uh, all biodiversity that's there when we may lose very critical biodiversity if we, uh, if we pursue only that strategy. And so uh, another strategy, of course, uh, and the one that's gonna be the focus of the symposium today is, uh, is genomics. And um, genomics can be used to identify uh, genes related to adaptation and resilience to climate change, but it can also be used directly. And this is from uh, a slide from one of our speakers, my colleague, uh, Dr. Carolyn Hoke at uh, University of Sydney. And of course, another, uh, another important uh, uh, mechanism for conservation is, is genomic, is, is genomic is genomic science and creating genomic tools that can be used for implementation of management plans for endangered species. And Carolyn and several of our speakers today will be, uh, will be talking about this strategy. So what then is the global status of eukaryotic uh, genome sequencing? And this is not just the Earth Biogenome Project, this covers all uh, projects, all sequencing uh, uh, across the entire planet, all laboratories in every country. And as you can see uh, from this uh, nice rainbow chart, uh, that uh, if you use the number here, which is of 1.4 million, I used the number 1.8 million before, but there are 1.4 million named species in the ISCBN or, or the NCBI uh, databases. Of those, as of September 21st, 2021, uh, about 8,000 species have some degree of sequence information. That's whole genome sequence information, not just fractions, not just mitochondria, but have whole genome sequence information. And I guess the sobering fact here is that if you consider that total, that means that less than 0.1%, 0.6% of known eukaryotic species have had their genome sequence. And if you include all of biodiversity, if that if the 1.4 million is 10% or less, then we are less than point, uh, you know, 0.1% of all known eukaryotic species. Everything we know at the genomic level that is derived from less than 0.1% of species that have been described, which is quite sobering. Uh, if you look at this chart again, you'll see uh, that even at the phylum level, uh, only 80% of the approximately 70 uh, phyla that I can't even agree on the number of phyla, it's probably about 70 to 72, uh, only about 80% uh, of those even at that high level have had a representative species that have been sequenced. So uh, there's a, a long way to go and a lot to do. And if we look at the distribution of species uh, across the eukaryotic tree, that of course is also tremendously skewed toward the things that we really know about. Uh, 
uh, such as the plants and the animals and fungi. Uh, but the fact is that most of Earth's eukaryotic biodiversity, which remains as yet undescribed, is in these many groups of microbial eukaryotes, many of which are even single cell eukaryotes. So we really are uh, at the very beginning. And so uh, to address these issues, uh, about five years ago, uh, a group of colleagues uh, proposed what is now known as the Earth Biogenome Project, which is a confederated international network of networks that has a common goal of sequencing and annotating the genomes of all 1.8 million uh, known or described species of eukaryotes in a 10 year time frame. And so uh, really the goal of, of, of the project is to create then a digital repository of life on earth, which then can be used to address fundamental questions about the origins of eukaryotic cells all the way up through um, the characterization and understanding of whole ecosystems and of course, for also for conservation. And um, these would be, uh, uh, in a, once those questions are addressed, uh, we uh, are then would be able to, of course, develop the tools for mitigating the effects of, of climate change, building a sustainable bioeconomy, uh, helping to uh, identify the next source uh, uh, of where the, the, the next uh, pandemic agents are coming from, and of course, just directly creating management programs for uh, threatened species. And so the Earth Biogenome Project now as it stands, uh, the, the network consists of 43 member institutions in uh, 22 countries, uh, 49 affiliated projects and more than 5,000 participants. And I'll add that the Earth Biogenome Project is an open project. Uh, if you are interested in this, of course, there are many uh, countries that are have still not, uh, you know, uh, still do not have uh, a participating institution. Several who are participating in this uh, meeting today, and I welcome all of you to join. Please just uh, send me an email. It's a relatively simple process, and we'd be really pleased if you have large-scale programs to have you join you, your project or your institution uh, join as well. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll point out another feature here. Uh, for example, uh, it shows just a, a single node here in Africa. This is the where the African Biogenome Project is headquartered. I was on a call with Africa DP this morning. And this network, again, it's a network of networks, the network of the Africa BP currently consists of 22 countries already in Africa and is making very rapid progress. And if we look in the, uh, in the Asia Pacific region, of course, we have the University of, 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 of Sydney, we have uh, BioPlatforms Australia, and we have La Trobe University. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, uh, we really would welcome the participation of Indonesia, and Malaysia, and, and India, which also has a what they're calling a, a biogenome project. That we are still in the process of discussing with them their membership. Okay, so the uh, model for the network of networks is a hub and spokes model. Uh, this is just a model. It doesn't uh, really represent uh, the 43 institutions and 40 nine different affiliated projects today, but just that we would have a uh, hubs in each of the biogeographical regions that would be responsible for sequencing and informatics. Uh, and then we have, which could be of course hooked to networks themselves, as well as these affiliated uh, projects which are related to work on individual uh, eukaryotic taxa. And uh, the Earth Biogenome Project, uh, uh, itself, uh, really the project serves as a major coordinating function for uh, setting standards for sample collection uh, and uh, sequencing and annotation, uh, 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 informatics and data analysis and information technology. And uh, all of the projects that are members who have signed the memorandum of understanding 
are committed to open uh, data access and compliance with the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocols. I'm sure on access and benefit sharing, I'm sure there'll be questions about this. And also we are committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice among all EBP uh, scientists and peoples uh, of the world. And we have two very important committees of the EBP. One is the Ethics, Legal, and Social Issues Committee, and the other is the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, both which have representatives uh, from uh, many countries throughout the world, including, of course, Global South. Now, uh, the EBP will be accomplished in uh, with two different strategies, one which we call the phylogenomic wave, and I'll just go through this very quickly. The phylogenomic wave says phase one will sequence a representative for each of the eukaryotic families in the first three years to reference quality. Um, phase two, years four through seven, would be to sequence the representative species from each of the approximately 160,000 genera. And the final phase is, phase is completion of all uh, uh, known eukaryotes, about 1.8 million in the out years, years eight through 10. And we'll talk a little bit more about the challenges of doing that toward the end of my presentation today. Second strategy is the ecosystem sequencing uh, strategy. And this would involve location sampling, uh, understanding what is there uh, using strategies, for example, such as environmental DNA, but uh, more prominently in the Earth Biogenome Project, sequencing all organisms in a particular geographical area, uh, for example, within uh, biodiversity hotspots. We already have examples of these, such as the Wife uh, of Woods Project as part of the Darwin Tree of Life Project, and sequencing everything that's there will enable the development of new technologies for assessing uh, changes in biodiversity over time, which, which would allow for, uh, for, bio, for biosurveillance, how biodiversity is changing, uh, for example, uh, as in response to climate change. And uh, this uh, then would enable a multidimensional and dynamic view of, of life on earth. So the strategies are not mutually exclusive and we're using them together to, to reach uh, the final goal. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, approximately 10% uh, 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 of, of species have been, or nine, this is, shows about 9% of species have been sequenced. And to the right shows Earth Biogenomes uh, Project contribution to that total after just a few year, short years. Uh, EBP's contribution is about 10% of the total. But um, importantly, since phase one is involves uh, sequencing a reference genome for each of the eukaryotic families, uh, the EBP is uh, contributing disproportionately already to the sequencing at the family level, where we have about 26% of all uh, families uh, that are represented uh, in NCBI have been sequenced by EBP affiliated projects. Um, and uh, this is sort of. Time of a, now, Harris. Sorry. What's that? I, I show 15 minutes. How am I doing? Yeah, have, yeah uh, you've gone minutes. over a little bit. No, well, um, we're oh, I thought I had uh, 20 Q &A. minutes. <laughs> oh, I thought <laughs> I had 18 minutes. Did <laughs> I not have 18 minutes? Yeah. Sorry, keep going. But <laughs> Okay, I will finish up quickly. Uh, so things are progressing rapidly. We've doubled the number of species uh, that have sequenced in three years. We're now at uh, 15 about 15% of chromosome scale assemblies in EBP has contributed about 40% of all chromosome scale assemblies at the international level. And at, at the end of the next three years, uh, we anticipate uh, about at the end of the next year, we anticipate another 3000 uh, uh, sequences, which will get us to about a third of the way toward the goal of a representative species of each family. The first publications have been uh, coming showing that we can produce as a community high quality reference genomes at scale. Uh, uh, the VGP is one of those examples. The, um, the uh, Darwin Tree of Life is another uh, example with 200 species, uh, species, 210 species already submitted, 1,300 in progress. Uh, I suspect that uh, Carolyn is going to cover a lot about 
conservation, but we know that already from sequencing a single individual, it's possible to tell a lot about their threatened status. And if you look at overall heterozygosity and stretches of homozygosity, you can see that the seven threatened and uh, seven endangered species in this group of 131 new species that were sequenced by the Zoonomia consortium uh, have low levels of heterozygosity and significant runs of homozygosity. I'll skip this, uh, but it's very important project uh, in California, which involves um, you know, uh, sequencing of more than 150 reference genomes and annotating those genomes and resequencing 150 genomes from for each of those uh, species uh, from different populations around the state of California. And, you, and, and this is the distribution. You see 100 different families, uh, very good species distribution. It's not just animals, animals and plants. And as you can see, we're well on our way. Uh, Brad Schaefer is leading this project at UCLA. We have all the samples for hi-fi sequencing and uh, for scaffolding. 53 uh, samples already have had data generated for a high C and 15 uh, genomes are already, uh, I'm sorry, for high five, 43 for high C and uh, 15 already uh, submitted. So uh, to conclude, we're not doing this project because it's easy, but because it's very difficult, we have significant challenges in reaching all three phases from sourcing and acquiring. It's not the technology, it's really getting access to the specimens and setting up global coordination, doing assemblies and curation at scale, uh, and, um, and, and really doing whole genome alignments and analysis and visualization at scale. We're going to have to achieve more than 25-fold increase in throughput to where we are today to complete the project in 10 years. So uh, it's not going to be easy, it's going to be hard, but every scrap of biological diversity is priceless, cherished, and never to be surrendered by a struggle, and uh, we must take immediate action. So I want to thank my colleagues, all of my colleagues in the Earth Biogenome Project for uh, their incredible dedication uh, to this project, especially during the difficult months and now years of the pandemic. And uh, so thank you all very much. And uh, my clock still shows a minute left for such questions, but I'll let you call <laughs> we, it, Brooke. I'm sorry, we had we did have time for Q&A, but it's, okay. it's, sort of, it's sort of running low. So I'll take, I'll leave it to you. Okay, Nathan. all right. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Harris. Thank it's fascinating. Yeah. So, sorry to rush you through that. I wish we had more time, but we, we might really come back because we've got a bit of time reserved at the end. So if people can- oh, um, I'll be here. Yeah, I've, sure. I've got several questions for Harris myself, but hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end. We, I might pass over now to uh, Jerome, who, who can uh, introduce Andrew, but yeah, save your questions for Harris for in about an hour okay. and it's time, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Nathan. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Andrew Crawford, who's the Associate Professor from the Department of Biological Science coming from Columbia. So he himself is also the Executive Council Member of the Vertebrate Genomes Project, and also the representative of the Earth Our Genome Project in Colombia. So with the further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Crawford. Uh, Hello, can everyone hear me? We got you, yes, we got you. Okay, <laughs> so I'm, yeah, I had a little technical, technical difficulties with my computer, so I'm on the phone now. And I guess, will this work then, Tina? You can share the slides? I'm very sorry about this. Yes, that'll. Uh, yes, it's sharing. Okay, great. Um, wow, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so time's a wasting. Um, uh, first, I want to thank the organizers. This is a big honor uh, to be here, and thank you so much. And good morning to you, and good evening from Colombia. And uh, I'm uh, going to tell you tonight about or this morning, a little bit about EBP, which you just heard about from Harris, and I'm gonna talk about EBP Columbia, and what is the context here. So uh, let's go, next slide. We'll try to do this kind of quick, since I'm right behind. So for those of you on the other side of the ocean there, here's uh, the location of Columbia and the Northwest corner of South America. And um, uh, next slide, you can divide up uh, Columbia in five regions. 
And there's the very wet Chocoa on the Pacific side. It has part of the Amazon rainforest. In orange, it has these plains, the Jandos. Uh, it has this dry seasonal yellow part, which is the Caribbean coast. And not one or two, but three chains of the Andes Mountains. So all this uh, environmental diversity really has uh, promoted a lot of biodiversity. So Colombia is, by some reckoning, number two in the world in uh, biodiversity. So very important for uh, biodiversity genomics. Uh, and no, go ahead, go ahead, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, I'm so sorry. Okay, so the important thing to know about Colombia right now is that we're in a very special point in history and that five years ago, there was a peace accord signed between the government and the FARC uh, guerrillas. And that has created both an incredible opportunity for exploration, but also exploitation. So this map here is showing you national parks in Colombia and in dark red are ones where there's been illicit uh, deforestation going on. So that's a threat. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so down here, we're seeing a map of mining before and proposed mining after the accord. So that's legal, but also another form of how to use the natural environment. So we need to get in now and uh, characterize the biodiversity that we have and see how we can use it wisely. So next. Great. So, uh, and biodiversity genomics has now become part of official government policy. And this is just starting now uh, and this year in the last few years. So there's a couple of programs. One is Columbia Bio, which is exploring biomes and genomes as well. And I'll show you examples of that. And this uh, Misión de Sabios is a advisor, science advisory group. And actually uh, two members of that group are also the leaders of EVP Columbia. And I'll present you those uh, people in a second. And I'll skip down to the last one and tell you more about the national bioeconomy strategy. So next. And that is, so this is the government policy on how to use bioeconomy, which means how we can use this natural diversity that we have here, which is tremendous, as part of the economy, sustainably used and exploited and make it part of, of how the government increases its GDP. So the first two items, one and two, are bioprospecting and biodiversity inventories, which are fundamental. And the second one is it includes omics, of course, genomics and biodiversity genomics in the name of conservation and also innovation. So next, please. Okay, so here's our two leaders of this EVP Columbia initiative that uh, Harris presented for us, Silvia Restepo from my university and also Federica de Palma, who's heavily involved in EVP and the VGP and uh, programs like that. And uh, me, I'm here as representative. So uh, next, don't have to tell you more about EVP. Uh, so EVP Colombia is just now two years old and we're taking a more bottom up approach, trying to bring people with these interests uh, together. And uh, we involve universities, the Ministry of Science of so the government, as well as biodiversity research institutes. Next. Thanks. And so we've been looking around and talking and, and checking around the Colombia. And so there's about five chromosome level eukaryotic genome assemblies in progress, already started, hopefully almost done, and about 54 more uh, draft assemblies that are done or, or, or in development. So that's not bad for, uh, for a start. Uh, next. There we go. And uh, following the proposed uh, outline for this talk, uh, methods, of course, are pretty standard. Within country, uh, our only options are nanopore and alumina. And uh, next. And uh, my seeks. Uh, outsourcing is, uh, of course, how we get the bigger projects done. And uh, we're working closely with the VGP as well. Uh, Federica and I are involved with them. And they use a three-pronged approach to develop G uh, chromosome level genome assemblies. So uh, next, let's go. So now I'm gonna show you five examples if there's time. <laughs> so one of the first geno eukaryotic genomes we developed was the uh, capybara. And the, this is the world's biggest rodent. And so the question there was uh, if, rates of cancer per cell division are the same, very large organisms should be dead. But of course we have elephants and whales, so they're not dead. Uh, so how do they do this? And apparently different organisms have solved it different ways. And so here's uh, my former master's student, Santiago, now at Chicago, uh, who looked at this by doing genome scans and um, uh, comparative genomics. So next. Whoa. Uh, yeah, so he actually found that certain outlier loci rapidly evolving proteins and expanding gene families were related to solving cancer and of course large growth. Uh, next we'll have to this is already published as you'll see 
So I won't go into tremendous detail, but there were some valuable insights there uh, that we got out of this uh, project, which is based here. Go ahead. Please, woo. And uh, okay, so rapidly, four more projects. One is on that fabulous Andean bear, which is conservation genomics. So we'll use the reference genome uh, to orient us on uh, genome sequences from feces, hair, museum collections to inform conservation plans for this high elevation bear. Next. And this is kind of an exciting uh, project. A hundred years ago, there was a bird survey in Columbia run by the American Museum. And so it's being resurveyed. And of all the birds, three species are going to have uh, chromosome quality genomes assembled. And we'll use those to compare uh, the impact of 100 years of habitat um, loss and how's that impacted the genomes in these species. And those are being sequenced with BGP as well. Go ahead. Next slide, please. Uh, and another uh, number four is on a project uh, related to informing sustainable harvesting of an economically important species of bivalve. Uh, um, uh, next slide, please. We'll have to move it along a little bit. Sorry about that. And uh, uh, my own interest is more, actually more often in frogs. And this is a project that's being run through BGP and a collaboration with Columbia University, where we're gonna look at the genomic basis of phenotypic uh, diversity in this frog. So next, we're almost done, I think. So now we'll finish with challenges, solutions. Uh, and the challenges are, of course, field collections, but this has been much approved, improved in Colombia. So that's great. Still not totally easy. Export permits, much improved domestically. Fantastic. Uh, whoops, that one minute. <laughs> okay, so Convention on Biological Diversity is going to be very important, very critical for us. Um, and cold chain is important. Uh, so next slide, please. We're very close, I think. And of course, uh, sequencing and computation are um, limited resources. So everywhere. Next slide. So the solutions, the immediate best solution right now for some of these problems like export permits, cold chain supply chain is Oxford nanopore sequencing, although that may not get us the EDP quality genomes in all cases. Um, and we need those piece of cords to really make progress in any of these areas at all. So the last slide uh, is this. And I think the biggest, uh, most important next step is to make sure that we involve all sectors of Colombian society and biodiversity genomics with clear and stated benefit sharing uh, plans. Uh, it's a very diverse country and there's a lot of people with a lot of different uh, interests. So thank you for your time. Uh, and uh, we have to take questions now or later. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't too awkward with the logistics. Sorry about that. Thank you, Andrew. I mean, I don't see any questions from the audience. So um, um, maybe I just answer a quick one. So how do you prioritize for the, for the genome study you have chosen to be sequenced? Uh, prioritizing is, uh, um, that's mostly individual researchers are coming up with their own projects, of course, and then using this uh, EBP umbrella, of course, we can advise and uh, instruct and connect people with like interests and connect them with larger groups. But each, if somebody has an interest in fish or birds or frogs. And, sure. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank sure. you. It's, it's bottom up, let's say, not top down. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank Provost. you so much. Okay. So now we are going to have our next speaker, Dr. Caroline Hall. So uh, Caroline is the Senior Research Manager for the Australasian um, Wildlife Genomics Group in the Faculty of Science at the University of Sydney. So she has been working on the conservation of fragment species for over 25 years in both in Australia and overseas. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Hall. Thank you very much, Jerome, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the Australian biodiversity genomics. And, and as um, both Nathan and Harris alluded to, this is, of course, is biodiversity within the Pacific Rim. So these are all the Pacific Rim nations. And of the 17 mega diverse countries in the world, so those are the 17 countries in the world that hold 60 to 80 percent of global biodiversity, uh, more than 11 of those countries actually exist on the Pacific Rim. So um, really biodiversity genomics for the Pacific Rim is, a, is an extremely important topic moving forward, um, particularly in light of the biodiversity crisis that Harris was discussing earlier. 
So if we look down here in Australia, uh, Australia has um, a number of different vertebrate, invertebrate and plant species. And because we uh, broke away from all the other continents um, millions and millions of years ago, a large proportion of the species that we have here in Australia are in fact endemic. So are not found anywhere else in the world, which of course raises the profile again of why it's so critically important for us to uh, get a handle on what biodiversity we have. If you look at what our challenges are in our region, uh, Australia is an extremely large continent. Uh, and in this map, you can see here, uh, our population is very small. Uh, there's only 23 million people in the whole nation. Uh, and we all pretty much found around the coastal regions of the East Coast and, and down in the Southwest corner. And so what that means is a large number of our biodiversity and the species we want to investigate are in extremely remote locations um, and trying to get highly high quality samples for genome sequencing from these areas can be severely problematic. In addition to that, um, we only have two locations in which we can do PacBio SQL2 sequencing within Australia, um, another two locations that do Oxford Nanopore, and another two locations where we can do high C. So although we're a big continent, small population, um, sequencing is, is becoming problematic within Australia itself. Um, Compute, as well as Andrew was saying, is a severe problem. Our solution to that has really been moving more towards the cloud computing with the commercial providers. Uh, we've set up a partnership with Amazon Web Services, uh, which is really um, quite significant for us. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later on. And also just making sure we have the skills uh, within our nation to do bioinformatics, that's both assembly and annotation, but also really how do we teach um, the different conservation managers on how they should be using uh, the different types of data sets for conservation application. So one of the ways Australia is dealing with this challenge is there's an organisation called BioPlatforms Australia, which is a federally funded body, which is designed to uh, generate not only support the sequencing companies, but also bring together the different um, research scientists and conservation agencies, as well as industry and agriculture, to try and create genomic resources for, for a suite of different reasons. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about what they've been doing in their environmental theme, which has been creating uh, reference genomes and doing phylogenomics and taxonomy, particularly for a suite of um, Australian marsupials, as well as some of our plants and the reptiles and amphibians. And I'm going to talk a little bit more now about what I, uh, the project I'm leading in collaboration with Kathy Bellov and a number of other people around the country is our Threatened Species Initiative. So as Harris said, there's a large proportion of uh, species that are in fact endangered at a global level. And what we can find is that when we looked at it in um, 2018, less than 1% of all genomes that were publicly available of the 15 and a half thousand animal species that are listed threatened globally, um, less than 1% of them had a reference genome. Uh, I'm pleased to say three years later, as Harris was showing in his talk, that number is increasing, but it's still a very, very small piece of the pie. Uh, so the aim really over the next decade is to get that piece of the pie pretty much completed. And the reason we want to create genomes and reference genomes for threatened species is that conservation managers globally know that genetic diversity is important. They know that their diversity and inbreeding are inversely related, that if we're going to be able to maintain any form of adaptive potential, particularly in, in light of climate change, um, that species really need to be able to maintain diversity to be able to adapt to changing events. And also just at an individual level, uh, it also helps their individual fitness and, and their ability to survive. And what we've come to realise uh, both here in Australia as well as in other parts of the globe is, is there's now a, a, quite a large divide between the geneticists and genome biologists on the one side and all the ecologists, conservation managers and policy makers who need to use genomic information to make more informed conservation decisions on the other side. And so the aim of the Threatened Species Initiative under the EPB banner is to really create a bridge uh, between this gap, because we know that by bridging the gap, we can start to provide information that can significantly assist in lowering extinction rates. So what is the Threatened Species Initiative? Um, it's about developing genomic resources for Australia's threatened species. And so we are doing reference genomes for some species. Uh, for other species, we're simply are starting to generate just some population genetic data. So as you can imagine, there's a, a large range of species within Australia that are threatened and they're undertaking a number of translocations or captive breeding. Uh, and this has not be, uh, become very, very important, particularly since we had the very large bushfires a couple of 
years ago. And so just providing um, species with some genetic data initially is, is also a name of the project and then moving more towards uh, collecting high quality samples that we can move on into developing reference genomes for. Probably most important to the TSI uh, is actually what we're developing is an applied conservation genomics portal. And this is an online toolkit for conservation managers. And so the aim of, of the portal is to develop it so it works here within Australia, but uh, eventually we would like to be able to make it available at a global scale. And what the portal does is you can bring your reference genome, you can bring your population genetic data, um, you put it into the portal and it automatically fires up a, super, a supercomputer in the cloud um, and it allows you to run your analysis and provides the conservation managers with a standardised report. So one of the things we've come to realise in conservation genomics is that there's a big gap between uh, what academics will produce for conservation managers and, and how they can use that information. And one of the things we would like to do is standardise the way we report the different metrics, whether they be heterozygosity or inbreeding or population differentiation or population structure to help upskill the conservation managers and policy makers who, who really need this information for their decision making. So where we are currently uh, with the Threatened Species Initiative in Australia is we're doing 62 species and you can see uh, across a range of different threat status, including uh, three extinct in the wild species. And, and for me personally, if we can't bring the extinct in the wild species back from, from this category and, and delist them down to critically endangered or even endangered, then really we're starting to fail in our ambition to, to preserve biodiversity. And as you can see, it's also representative across a suite of different taxa. Uh, the large number of plant species you can see in this pie chart is because of all the threatened species in Australia, about two thirds of them are in fact plants. Not only that, is um, we've also got it across, it's a national consortium. There's about 120 collaborators ranging from uh, private conservation agencies, such as the Australian Wildlife Conservancy and the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, and also the rest is from scientists, from academia, as well as government. And one of the requirements of, of being involved in TSI and, and getting funding support from Bioplatforms Australia for your sequencing is that the academics or the people who are producing the genetic data must show a conservation relationship with the on-ground managers and show how the data that we're generating will actually be applied in real time to help inform management decisions. Uh, and as you can see, it's also spread quite uh, widely across Australia with a, a large number of species being done in New South Wales, as well as Victoria and Queensland. And, and that's because that's where the bushfires occurred on our east coast. So uh, it's not a small consortium by any means. There's a large number of parties now involved, ranging from universities, government agencies, the zoo community, museums, the other uh, genomics projects within Australia, uh, and particularly as well a shout out to the, the technical companies with Illumina and AGRF and, and um, the cloud computing who've really come to the table to bring biotechnology um, to help us develop faster ways in which we can transfer data sets as well as analyze data sets and share them with collaborators globally. So uh, yeah, that's it. So if anyone's got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ho. Uh, we, we don't have any questions and time is about right. So if it's okay, maybe we'll, we'll leave the discussion at the end together with other speakers, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Ho, again, I mean, for the very interesting talk. So uh, for, for our next speaker, we have uh, Dr. Hirati, Hirawati Sudoyo, who is the deputy for the fundamental research for the uh, Jakarta in Indonesia. So she is also the head of forensic DNA laboratory and the principal investigator for genome diversity and disease laboratory. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Sudoyo. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Good morning, good day, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you uh, the Indonesian biodiversity genomes and what we actually face as a challenges, and also look at the opportunities. Uh, of course, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to share our experience in the biodiversity. Unlike Australian or Colombia, who already work in a big or large project on um, 
biodiversity, what I'm going to share is the experience on how the genomic uh, study started from human to wildlife. And that things that I would like to share and for you to look at how we develop and how we face the challenge and trying to get the solution. So what kind of initiative that we have in Indonesia? I came from the Ekman Institute for Molecular Biology, who is working on the human, uh, human diversity and diseases. So it is uh, kind of like uh, jumping or actually broadening the project at the Ekman Institute. The first initiative is for Indonesian Genome Diversity Project from human to pathogen and then to wildlife. And what the aim of the study in Indonesia is to do the genomic and functional genomic of Indonesian population and its association of susceptibility to complex disease and infectious disease. Of course, the second one is genetic variants and microbiome. Those activity that I learned also actually being used for studying the biodiversity from our colleague here. And the, that the facilities that we have is actually could be used, of course, for other organisms. So how we develop that, actually we studied um, more than 140 communities, more than 3,500 samples collected. We already have 200 human whole genome sequence data, more to come. And- I'm sorry to interrupt. I mean, are you going to share some uh, slides with us? I'm a... Oh. I think, oh, hang on, hang on. Sorry. Share screen. Sure. Is that? Yes. Oh my God. Okay. So this is the Indonesian biodiversity. This is the initiative that we already have. Uh, and uh, of course, collaboration is very important. We have 21 collaboration for this kind of activity. Let's look at the initiative for SARS-CoV-2 genomic survey in Indonesia. This, the initiative is actually a collection of 19 institutions and by 15th of November, we have about 9,000 uh, whole genome sequencing. So what kind of uh, facility that we could have? And if people actually look at the facility and look at the activity that they can, that they can actually develop, uh, Illumina platforms is being used mostly uh, in Indonesia. Of course, Nanopore and for targeted sequence is Ion Torrent. And I'm just want to, uh, I just want to share with you uh, the four big projects that we have, the wildlife uh, conservation genetics and for, for forensic purposes. So uh, what is the goal? to do the identification, species identification, sex ratio and distribution and origin, because we have to support our colleague uh, from a uh, forensic uh, side. So one thing that we also uh, develop is actually building population database of the elephant, uh, Sumatran and the country. So we already have about uh, 900 uh, database of the elephant, which actually show you that some of them are actually homogeneous. And with this kind of activity, we support the study for the conservation, which is actually being developed between the Indonesian government and some uh, institution, international institution, such as uh, WCS, WWF, and some university involved in the conservation study, and also uh, Frankfurt Zoological Society. This activity is supported, we have been asked from the Ministry for uh, 
environmental to support them in terms of looking at uh, how the data could be actually uh, built uh, for conservation purposes. And the uh, Rhino project, uh, of course, uh, it is because we know that the dung samples have been used to estimate population sizes in wildlife. So in collaboration with International Rhino Foundation, uh, Indonesian Rhino Foundation, Ministry of uh, Environmental and University of Illinois, a whole genome sequence data has been collected from two individuals and uh, developed the marker for identification using 29 polymorphic macrolide starter. And this, we could actually characterize the variability between the markers for high quality DNA. So optimization has been successful and this could be actually uh, applied to all of the dung samples that we have been collected from free ranging of rhinos in Indonesia. The other things that we, uh, we are also uh, studied is the Orang Utan project. Uh, what is the aim? The aim is actually to evaluate and clarify taxonomy. So we go to molecular taxonomy. Uh, that, and also we would like to assess the genetic variability and identify the Orang Utan subpopulation for repatriation purposes. So the method is actually looking at the hypervariable region of the mitochondrial DNA and a control region, the 12S sarabosomal RNA, cytochrome B, and of course, a DNA barcoding, and also a mitochondrial genomic, total genomic. And what do we see and what is the result of this activity is actually we could identify the markers for the Bornean orangutan, Sumatran orangutan, and one, the new one uh, subspecies, the Tapanuli orangutan. So this is good actually for uh, all of the uh, conservation study. So then the last uh, slide is actually challenges that we face working on biodiversity in Indonesia. And what is the solution? Of course, funding. Funding is very important in terms of if we have the manpower, if we have the infrastructure, the funding become also uh, will be completed our task. Government international grants for sustainable future activities. It happens to other diversity, human as well as pathogen. We need sustainability and long-term investment in infrastructure and human resources. Not only funding is, say, for example, with the COVID pandemic, every grant is actually goes to COVID-19. What happened if the pandemic is finished or disappeared? Technical expertise or manpower development, uh, yes, we have available availability of local expert, but it's varied in different region. So training and also uh, maintaining the manpower is, is very, very important. The high throughput technology uh, has been inquired, uh, acquired only in a limited number of research institution. Therefore, the Strengthening manpower in genomic and bioinformatics is, is very, very important. Equipment and reagents. Okay, with the cutting edge NGS availability, which is mostly Illumina and Nanopore, we need affordable pricing policy. Because it's uh, in a, uh, here in the country, it's two or three times uh, more expensive than others. Access to the digital resources, yes, we do actually have cloud, we do have supercomputer, but it is limited for only uh, uh, um, in a good institution. 
access to uh, sorry education for the public and relevant stakeholders we have problem with this so we know that it is very very important then to uh, to present the data uh, supporting evidence to the uh, local uh, to the authority and uh, yes, I think networking between stakeholders is very important. That is about time, Harati. Yes, thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk. Okay, thank you very much. The time is just uh, perfect, I mean, uh, but we don't have time for Q&A. Uh, thank you. We, we will save the discussion to the end and then we can discuss with speakers and if we see any additional questions from audience. Thank you again. So next we have uh, 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 Professor Balaji uh, Chetopahe. So his research incorporates high throughput uh, genomic data alongside biological and ecological data to understand the climate change effect on wildlife. I mean, and also the, and, uh, the management. So with further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Chetopahe. Hi, uh, I am unable to share my screen. Uh, yes. I think someone is still sharing. Let me try again. Yeah. Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah. Great. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. So I'll actually share uh, some of my experiences uh, uh, from uh, Singapore working at NUS, uh, where we looked into biotic evolution in the tropics, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Okay, so, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, the region has one of the richest biodiversity across the globe, and it's also heavily uh, urbanized, uh, habitat degradation takes place at a very fast rate and we might be losing species before we discover them that's uh, you know that that's what the importance is however in terms of uh, singapore it's a small city state uh, and when we're looking at uh, you know biodiversity studies uh, across southeast asia from uh, singapore uh, one of the advantages of course that uh, you have uh, multiple institutions uh, with many next gen sequencing facilities across the uh, country or across the city. Uh, turnover time is very low. So you get, uh, you know, you provide samples, you get within a few weeks, that's great. Uh, you have all the high throughput sequencer uh, available around. Uh, part of our CBIC initiative, that's Southeast Asian Biodiversity Genomics Initiative that we also actually developed a small uh, historic DNA genomic facility at NUS itself. And, and of course you have the museum collections, uh, very rich collection at the Conchian Museum of Natural History at NUS. Okay, so some of the initiatives, not just uh, whole genome sequencing, but also uh, population genomics and others uh, uh, that I was part of, uh, some of these uh, were that of the Sunda fruit bat, uh, whole genome as population genomics, and then the critically injured Siamese crocodiles. Then uh, we have the babblers, again, uh, in, uh, in addition to others. Right, so some of the programs, of course, uh, you know, these are mostly Illumina based sequencing other than metagenomics, where uh, a lot of nanopo sequencing also had taken place. And for some other organisms, which I did not work, uh, you know, and, and this is like a few years back. So we also had used uh, PacBio long reads. So most of the, uh, are some of the programs that we used, I'm still using actually, I'm, I'm still in collaboration with uh, NUS uh, for multiple projects. Uh, so assembly programs, you have uh, uh, a assembly for highly heterozygous genomes. You have Masulka, which is uh, the latest uh, good assembler, actually really fast. And then you'll have uh, multiple programs for comparative genomics uh, that we use like CAFE, uh, ET toolkit and all. Uh, use PSMC to look into uh, evolution of uh, species through genomes. Uh, then uh, we have population genomic data through DDRATS kind of stuff, uh, you know, doing uh, admixture graphs, looking into admixtures, uh, target enrichment uh, data for using high piper angst kind of uh, programs and metagenomics, which I did not work on, but uh, other lab sister labs actually worked on this and uh, they actually established some pipelines for metagenomic data analysis. 
Okay, so uh, I'll briefly uh, actually talk about some of the experiences I had with uh, species around in Southeast Asia, really. Uh, one of these was where uh, we actually looked into conservation genomics of the critically endangered, endangered Siamese crocodile in Cambodia, uh, you know, to inform and, and we basically, uh, this project actually breached academic uh, research uh, and uh, uh, field-based conservation efforts. So we did uh, DD that set for about uh, 100 samples, 100 odd samples of uh, Siamese crocodile and uh, uh, saltwater crocodiles. And we actually looked into genomic purity. We, we found, uh, we actually located individuals uh, which we found were uh, integrated with uh, potentially Cuban lineages. So this is basically uh, uh, the plot where each bar is an individual and uh, on the y-axis, you actually have the genomic contribution from each lineage and color belongs to one species. So a couple of individuals we located were uh, ghost integration, which were probably from Cuban crocodiles that are readily integrated with Siamese crocodile to yield uh, a better quality of uh, leather. Then uh, we used uh, the genetic data and we also were able to identify uh, which population declined about 100 years back. That's about three generation backs also coinciding with time uh, of increased poaching and uh, farming of Siamese crocodile for leather trade. And we used again these genetic information of standing variation as well as historical demography uh, to predict what might happen in future. And we observed that uh, with uh, uh, this was what might happen in future uh, in Tonle Sap Lake with a relict uh, uh, with a with a remaining uh, population in Tonle Sap Lake in Cambodia. And what we realized is that within the next five generations, if the standing diversity stays, uh, these species might uh, the population might go extinct. Right. So. Uh, Coming to from crocodiles, coming to actually my main interest, that's bats. Uh, we actually uh, not only sequenced a uh, whole genome of a fruit bat, we also analyzed uh, about a dozen of uh, whole genome sequences from across the world of, of bats. And we did uh, paleoclimatic uh, modeling uh, to find out uh, you know, suitable habitats uh, across uh, time scales, uh, particularly across last glacial, uh, uh, last interglacial around 120,000 years back, uh, as well as uh, around uh, last glacial maxima. And additionally, using whole genomes, we also actually looked into the historical demography, the population fluctuations across millions of years in the species history. Right, so uh, while doing this, we realized that uh, what we found is that frugivores are particularly susceptible to global warming. And, and we found that, uh, you know, uh, habitat uh, fluctuations are quite, uh, quite closely coupled with population fluctuations as well. Uh, for large in insectivores, we found that, uh, you know, they generally have, uh, they have, uh, historically, they have low population size. And for most of the bats that uh, we looked into in our panel of studies, they entered Holocene or like uh, 12,000 years back uh, with very low genetic diversity. Right. So uh, coming back to particularly addressing Southeast Asian uh, issues, uh, we also looked into uh, a population of a commonly occurring fruit bat, uh, which lives close to humans, the Sunda fruit bat, Sinopterus brachiotis, uh, in Singapore. So Singapore actually faced heavy urbanization and forest, uh, you know, fragmentation as as well as species decline from somewhere in the 1940s, uh, using target enrichment uh, data from both uh, museum samples from uh, you know 1931 as well as contemporary samples, fresh samples. Uh, we actually looked into genetic diversity first, and we observed a huge decline of genetic diversity uh, from uh, you know, 1931 to 2011, 2012. Then we actually tried to model the historical demography uh, of this particular population. And what we observed is a huge, almost 30 fold population decline uh, somewhere around 1940s. That's you know, when urbanization started in Singapore in this population of fruit bat. So the take home message for this study was that even a commonly occurring species which lives close, close to human is actually quite sensitive uh, to changes in habitat. Right, uh, next up, we actually looked into for the uh, fruit bat genus Sinopterus, we looked into its distribution across the species range multiple lineages to understand the speciation history. Uh, this study is still ongoing. Uh, we are able to identify multiple uh, nuclear level uh, new uh, you know species lineages uh, in southeast asia and this plot basically uh, one is the phylogeny where you have the topology 
Uh, again, uh, uh, you see uh, some of the dates, it's actually a very rapid radiation. So there are multiple polytomies across the tree. And then these bars are basically uh, integration events. So we observe many integration events across Southeast Asia. Right, so challenges and solutions. Uh, major challenge, basically Singapore is a small country. So most of the studies are uh, you know, collecting samples from other countries. So that's the challenge is procuring samples, regulatory constraints. Uh, solution is of course using uh, museum samples, historic samples. And uh, again, you know, better maybe uh, exchange programs between institutions from across participating countries. Uh, I'll end it here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, uh, we, um, we, I don't see any questions in the chat. Also, maybe I just ask a quick one. So how about funding situation? I mean, so you mentioned about the challenges of obtaining samples, but I mean, funding for sequencing is not going to be a big issue or? or... No, no. So, so it's basically when you try to collect fresh samples, because we have to collect from many different countries. Uh, you know, we need to have standing collaborations and some countries, uh, it's easier to get permits for some countries, it may be not so easy to get permits. Uh, I, I'll give an example, right, uh, you know, not Southeast Asian, but if you come to South Asia, it's really difficult. If you come to India, it's so difficult to actually get permits uh, to work on samples. So in Southeast Asia also, at least when I was working, these are quite uh, a, a big problem. Uh, but, you know, the way around was, of course, to uh, leverage museum samples collections from museum samples. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Transport and all are not really an issue. It's mainly regulatory. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Nathan to introduce the next speaker. Yeah, thanks, Jerome. So next up, we have uh, Professor Subha Basu uh, from the University of Malaya, and she is currently the head of genetics and genome evolutionary biology. And she has about 25 years of experience teaching and doing research in the area of genetics on uh, biodiversity in the Malaya region. So we're looking forward to hearing about her developments in her field. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, very good morning. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yes, your question. Okay, just to check. Uh, uh, thank it's it's been an honor to to be able to speak at this platform and uh, thank uh, uh, the APRU committee and thanks everyone for giving that opportunity. The today's title is actually looking at the advent of genetics and genomics paving way to manage the nascent biodiversity resources. Uh, I rather look at it from a forward way of thinking, that is from 2021 to 2030. All right. Uh, next slide. It's not moving. Maybe use your arrow. Ah, piece. yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, uh, it's a bit slow, yes. Okay, now in uh, because we are looking at uh, what has happened and what is the way forward. Now in, in Malaysia, uh, we have actually reached to a consensus at the moment where we have agreed that we have to uh, give equal weightage for both sides. So uh, Malaysia is a country that is actually started off with a very uh, uh, into development term and uh, they actually focus on economics, poverty, elevation, and food security. But at the same time, we also have the other part of the, the stakeholders and also people who are very into conservation, which actually uh, uh, is uh, uh, given uh, very little importance in the last three, 20 years. So, but in, uh, during the pandemic, there was a shift of change of thoughts. And when, when people understood that you know, you have to actually conserve the natural resources, conserve the biodiversity, because like uh, Harris was saying, that if you don't do that, then uh, we will lose a lot of these ecological resources and natural resources. So if you look at the past in Malaysia, the emphasis was only on commercial crops. And we have 
uh, uh, sequence the all palm genome and that's it, you know, and, and we have a website and it's led by all these all palm industries. So it was always uh, championed by in that, uh, that, that way. So now uh, uh, we are looking at Malaysian experience in uh, sequencing genome. Um, I uh, personally work on aquatic resources and we started this project uh, on uh, prawns and shrimp. The only reason we took this as a biological indicator, uh, the reason is because it has a high commercial application. And therefore we used, we, we coined conservation efforts under this. And at the same time, uh, we wanted, um, we wanted the uh, policyholders to see how important is this species. And you know, macrobacterium is a, a biological uh, indicator in freshwater ecosystem. If the species is declining, it means uh, there is pollution in the river ecosystem. And then uh, my, my colleagues also work on banana genome because banana is also a commercial commodity. And they collaborated with uh, international uh, institutes like KU Living, and they actually joined the genome in, uh, consortium initiative. And uh, the third one is the easiest because when you work with small genome, you can quickly publish, you can quickly uh, get into the, the, the research, research uh, uh, visibility where a lot of my colleagues that worked on microorganisms, which were classified as pathogens and also uh, opportunistic pathogens and opp opportunistic microorganisms, which was very important in agriculture, aquaculture, biomedical and medical in, in, in initiative. There is a group that is working on ginger and ginger has medicinal properties. It is said to be involved in uh, curing cancer and so on. So this was approved in, the, in our country. And uh, the next approach, which is the 2021 to 2030, is these three areas, eDNA, metagenomic, and metabarcoding. Uh, this was, uh, it's like an ecosystem approach, like just now Harris was saying, um, uh, it is uh, 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 very affordable and it is some, it gives information for the stakeholders, policymakers, conservationists to, to manage their resources. We also have in biosis from UKM that actually work on uh, mangosteen and IOES who look at uh, jellyfish. These are the two uh, areas that is one jellyfish is actually uh, in ocean. So you want to see sustainability in ocean uh, area and mangosteen is a fruit crop which uh, involves uh, medicinal properties. So these are the six uh, initiatives that is in the country. Now, how, how are we doing this? Uh, first, is we have to collaborate uh, with academia and also industry. And there's a lot of uh, uh, industries that is booming at the moment, bioinformatics uh, industries, companies, where they actually help uh, because they, they have the, the, the finance. And at the same time, uh, they also are uh, interested in, in a certain crop or certain uh, resources. So they come to academia and we try to uh, bridge that collaboration. There is another important institution, we call it uh, FRIM and the Tropical Biodiversity Research Center in US. Uh, I'm just touching these two at the moment because of the lack of time. FRIM is a, a research institute that governs all the forest uh, area. And we also have a wildlife uh, department that also look into animals. And the Tropical Biodiversity Research Center was actually set up due to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, UM, University of Malaya is one of the oldest university, and we were the pioneers in biodiversity research. And this uh, biodiversity center was uh, set up because we even have a, a small natural history museum in, uh, in UM. Then the next uh, big institution is Malaysia Genome Institute. This uh, holds uh, institution that holds the facility uh, on all these uh, sequencing facilities and so on. Uh, but they still uh, face uh, uh, constraints in terms of getting the funding. And in within University of Malaya, we have the CRISTA, which is a, a center of research of system biology and structural bioinformatics. Now, this is what we, we in University of Malaya, uh, the, the center and the, the program and the institute are at currently doing. These are the analysis we are doing. Now, uh, I, I, because of the lack of time, uh, how do we actually capture the, the stakeholders, the, the, the grant givers? 
uh, on on funding biodiversity projects. So uh, progression from uh, genetics to genomics and progression from uh, in my 20, 30 years of career, how do we actually get stakeholders to listen to us? So what we did, uh, what actually in my research, in, in my research, I, I share what I did is I, I look at the host and the pathogen and the environment, same like uh, the, the Indonesian uh, uh, presentation where we, we try to capture about uh, how this interaction between host, pathogen and environment. And we try to address questions like all these following questions where we, we see whether there's signature of selection, signature of adaptation, genome duplication. Is there a functional adaptation based on different geographical locations? Now, when it comes to pathogen, we, we, we try to uh, give insights in genetics, whether the pathogen uh, survival and adaptation, why it's changing, why from those days, you know, we have animals in, in the world, why now there is a, a shift between pathogens jumping to a different host, because they don't have a host to survive, and therefore they find another host, that's why you can see pathogens shifting from, a, a, say, from a, from a bat, pathogens that you find in the bat, shift to a host. So these are the awareness that we try to uh, uh, do. And of course, environment, uh, as you say, the earlier presentation talked about climate change and uh, contamination. And this we address the food security and uh, biosecurity. Now, uh, this is a, a grant that uh, uh, University Malaya got, and it's a five-year grant. Uh, it is actually looking at the algae bloom. This is from an uh, Institute of Ocean and Science uh, led by Professor Lim. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Lim Potin, and they just got the grant this year, and they're looking at how the algae blooms are affecting the fish uh, productivity in the ocean. It's a very interesting project, and they managed to get secure a grant for this. And the reason is, you can see that there is an effect of climate change. You can see that the coral species are threatened, and therefore you can see the species diversity is changing. This is an uh, initiative that is normally initiated by the Coral Initiative Group. And this is feasible. And uh, this is all, the reason I'm sharing this presentation. It's just to take up uh, uh, Dr. Balaji's, uh, Professor Balaji's uh, comment. To have effective collaboration, we have to find a, a common ground. So I, I thought this was a very good case study where they actually came together and, and, and tried to preserve the corals. So, uh, and for the vertebrate and for the freshwater ecosystem group. Uh, we, if we want to work together, we have to find a targeted species and then we can work together. Now, challenges which cause sampling, bioinformatics skills and training, we have a problem now. Uh, we have masters of bioinformatics students and we also have, uh, we, are trained uh, we are training students in, in the areas of bioinformatics, computational biology, genetics, genomics, but once they finish their PhD, there's uh, no, no grounds for them to move to the next level because there's uh, not enough projects and not enough avenues for them to try the skills. I always uh, remember that when you're in the age of 21 to 30, that's the best time for you to really work on bioinformatics and computational. But when we lose this challenge uh, over the years and we have to retrain the students. Another thing is a lot of time grant managers will look into cost benefit analysis. And when they look at that, they don't see the ROI, return of investment in biodiversity. And that's where is the challenge in Malaysia. We have to show them that, you know, if you invest in this research, then you get your return of investment. You don't get it like how you do it in business. You, you get it in the long run for the future of our children, for the future of our grandchildren you know, future of the world, you know, the earth, you know, but we need to uh, come together and, and, and convince these people that you don't look at ROIs in five years, you look at ROIs in 10 years, in 20 years, in infinity, you know, that is something that we need to open the eyes of the people. And of course, grants for genome sequencing is very limited. It only can be done if we can convince people there is a return of investment that benefits the society. That is the most important thing. So from my point of view, uh, from the way I look at things, it's very simple. I, I have five strategies. 
I don't know whether you guys uh, agree. So I you remember when the first slide that I showed two hands coming together. So uh, putting that together, if you 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 put hands together, you know, uh, you you actually uh, manage to do better things. So if we look at it from five different strategies, we look at sustainability, we look at feed, we look at genetic improvement, we look from IOI, uh, you know, uh, uh, from um, computational, and we look at community engagement. We feel that we can actually use and coin these strategies and, 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 and try to tie biodiversity research into this. Uh, to that, I think I will end my presentation. Uh, uh, university of Malaya is the oldest university in uh, Malaysia. Thank you for giving us the honor to present. And uh, I come from a very, uh, two, two I, I, I share two affiliation. One is from SEBA and one is from Faculty of Science. So today, uh, my presentation is dedicated to Faculty of Science because I always tell uh, my students that uh, if you uh, preserve the ecosystem, uh, you can go far in life. So uh, th to that, I, I end my presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Subha. That was extremely informative. And I like your passion for the uh, environment. And it really came through. And we're, I think I wanted to ask you about the jellyfish. But I think we better move on. We'll come back to that, I think, uh, in, in a little while. So I think I better get uh, Haida Galvez to talk now. So Haida is a uh, assistant professor at the Institute of Crop Science uh, at the University of the Philippines. And Haida actually did her PhD in uh, Australia down at the University of Melbourne uh, in molecular genetics and plant breeding. So looking forward to hearing Haida talk about coconut genomics. Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, and uh, let me share my slide. Just go. Sorry for that. Okay. Okay. So again, good morning. So uh, I'd like to start my talk uh, by sharing this, that the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to see. So I hope that, uh, especially for those working on perennial crops, I know you can uh, understand why I'm, this is my first uh, inspiration for the talk. And of course, uh, for working in coconut. So uh, the outline of the talk, I will uh, just briefly uh, go through the Philippine Coconut Genomics Program. And then uh, I will focus on Coconut Genomics Project 8. And along with it, I'll be sharing major challenges. And then of course, how we work with partners and collaborators and some highlights. So just uh, tidbits of some highlights of accomplishments. And then uh, I'll show you that we actually have done a lot of informatics outreach from the project and uh, what we envision to be our next future research and hope to collaborate for data integration. And of course, uh, I'd like to end to what the ultimate goal or outcome we would like to support to the Philippine coconut industry. So this is actually the eight uh, component projects of the coconut genomics uh, program. So this, uh, there are eight, but actually there are uh, nine in all, but eight, technical uh, projects. But I'll just be focusing on uh, project eight. But as you see here, uh, all the eight projects are actually integrating. So from whole genome sequencing, and then of course, uh, gene expression, and involving, of course, large data analysis with bioinformatics. But at the end, we, uh, we aim to assemble genome-wide molecular markers. Uh, just hold on, I forgot to switch on my video. And then of course, uh, from uh, all towards from markers development, it's validated in genetic population and then towards application in marker assisted plant breeding. And then uh, here, 
I just I'm just focusing on project A where I'm actually uh, heading here. But I'll tell you the challenge, the very uh, major challenge, even before thinking of working on this crop. And this is actually our first project on whole genome sequencing and a very ambitious and challenging work uh, with coconut, a very long generation cycle crop uh, with five to 15 years before you can have the next generation or the productive year. And it depends on the variety. And this is uh, deployed with very large and complex genome around uh, 2.5 gigabase in size with more than 70% of repeats, actually. So again, uh, as we said, uh, it's a very challenging uh, kind of project and endeavor, but we said that success is a sum of small efforts. So you see that the way we accomplish actually, because from the start, we know that we don't have the capacity. So we partner and collaborate with uh, experts that have already experience in this area. So different projects have worked uh, with, for example, in project eight, we work, uh, we, we have a project collaboration with uh, Boyce Thompson Institute, with, with a group of uh, Dr. Lucas Mullier, because we had worked also in tomato. And then through uh, in the lab, uh, uh, students and my staff actually shuttled and do the initial work uh, in, at their laboratory. And then there we continue the genome assembly and annotation. So it's uh, it started just uh, three months uh, internship and then continue and do virtual uh, consultation. And in other projects, we also have uh, collaboration with Japan and another project also with Pennsylvania State University. So by the way, uh, as uh, earlier mentioned, the project is uh, with the uh, Philippine Genome Center for Agriculture. And then uh, the, we have actually uh, Dr. Lucas Molier and also Dr. Jan Carlson as among the technical uh, scientific advisory uh, committee. Then another one is uh, no noting the generation time of coconut. We are so lucky that we have already existing populations and materials uh, developed with our partner from the Philippine Coconut Authority. Otherwise we would have waited five years or even 15 years or 10 years before we can have uh, our genetic population to start with. So just focusing on Coconut Genomics Project 8, of which I'm heading. So the goal is really to come up with uh, at least a draft, but a functional uh, whole genome draft and assembly, sequence assembly, and will we'll become our source of markers and uh, establish as a draft database with pre-installed breeder tools. And of course, uh, since we are We'll be using a proof of concept to test for insect resistance. So we are targeting genes uh, associated or related to glandular trichomes and also for uh, insect resistance. So these are the different research activities. So there are four. And I'll just uh, uh, present the framework, how we are interrelated. So of course, a genome database. And then of course, continue mining, targeting for candidate gene sequences. And then, of course, we also have the entomologists working on the insect test. And here we work with germplasm. So there are really large germplasm with our partner with the Philippine Coconut Authority. And then we did, uh, based on preliminary draft, we already continue some cutilling and mining of uh, candidate genes and over targeting those uh, interesting alleles or some sequence variation. And from there, there are some uh, preliminary uh, validation in the greenhouse and also in the field to target for potential host resistant phenotypes and of course some characterization on the target trait as well. At the end, we are our output actually for this project is to come up with natural gene variants for these target uh, traits and identifying of course the specific genotype of coconut that are potentially uh, tolerant if not resistant to insect pests. So this is uh, overall bioinformatics workflow for us to come up with a, a good quality uh, genome, assembly, whole genome assembly, de novo, uh, derived from a dwarf uh, uh, variety of coconut. So we did actually a combination of PacBio, Illumina, that, this, uh, that it started in 2014, 2015. So this was the early uh, uh, functional and uh, advanced uh, sequencing platforms at the time. And then of course, we, we also managed to get some uh, with our collaborator, with uh, Dr. Mulas, Lucas Mullier. So we got some sequence uh, reads as well from Dovetail Chicago and improve our uh, genome quality. And then of course, 
uh, we did not do uh, transcript analysis in our specific project. So we used all available transcriptome data and uh, all evidences in the database that are available. And then we continue to uh, build the models and of course characterize or functionally annotated or ca can be characterized genes depending on uh, available uh, sequence data, uh, evidences from the database. So at the end, uh, from the row, I from the de novo genome assembly, we came up with genome-wide uh, markers. Of course, that's one output. And then based on the annotation, we have some characterization on possible ev evolutionary analysis. And we target, of course, for resistant gene analogs and some analysis on drought genes. And of course, since this is coconut, we are very interested in oil biosynthesis uh, related genes as well. So just highlights. So we have freely assembled, as I mentioned, this is a dwarf uh, variety of coconut. Uh, this is a Philippine variety, Katigan green dwarf. And uh, de novo, we have uh, assembled uh, good quality. And we have also uh, designed or built a prototype genome database with already pre-installed uh, relevant bioinformatic tools. This is based on uh, in prototype with the SGN also. And we have the publication of this one. So this where our uh, major output, we have uh, compared the evolutionary relationship or at least some insights of their biological uh, relationship with other major pumps. For example, it, we found that three rounds of whole genome duplication uh, are found uh, among in comparison with Arika Shea. And then some gene markers associated with economically important traits, protein coding, transcription factors, regulatory sequences, of course, our target this is some gene analogs and drought response genes, and of course, oil in coconut, and so many other genes of uh, industry interest. So, of course, uh, for future application in crop improvement, we design and mark the genome wide DNA markers for all other traits. So, we have SSRs, genome wide, we have also specific, and we also, of course, characterize our insect pests. And from field trials, we have identified some interesting candidate uh, insect resistant or tolerant uh, coconut varieties. So more characterization of the insect resistance genes at the gene and allele variation in the given germplasm sample. And then we hope to forward further to validate uh, applying forward or reverse genetics and to really characterize the mechanism of those candidate uh, insect resistant or tolerant uh, varieties of coconut or populations because they were still from the germplasm. And of course, uh, and uh, all the project, made. yeah, all the project aid is just more on uh, insect resistance. We also have characterized on OLG. So uh, just uh, browsing through, we did uh, bioinformatics uh, training. So just to show you that we have uh, capacity on bioinformatics analysis involving large data science. So, this is what we envision to continue. And we hope uh, also, of course, uh, involving drought tolerance, since uh, coconut is very susceptible to very limited water uh, availability. And since we have this uh, prototype and whole genome sequence, we hope to integrate this so that this becomes available and to all coconut researchers and workers. So at the goal really to help the Philippine coconut industry and achieve uh, outcome of uh, maximizing value traits and income from all parts of coconut. Okay, and I hope that coming together is just our beginning now, but we hope that we keep together to make progress and we keep working so that we really succeed uh, one time, little by little. Thank you. Thanks so much. Ida, that was fantastic. Now, so you have quite a lot of interactions with the coconut industry then it sounds like they, they are interested to hear your discoveries. Uh, uh, yes, because uh, it's essentially towards uh, crop improvement and targeting uh, those, uh, for example, quality traits and industrial properties of coconut where more further application. But uh, since uh, the Philippine germplasm holds the world largest collection of coconut uh, germplasm or populations. So it's very interesting that uh, although we just use as, for now we just use as our reference, we have one, uh, the dwarf variety, because that's the easier one to handle than the highly heterozygous and 
highly heterogeneous population of the tall varieties. But uh, we all, we, since we, we have, that's, I guess, the challenge is the funding wants us to give some deliverable of uh, an outstanding variety or a genetic market for target traits. So uh, not just the diversity. Uh, so that's why like once we have uh, mined the genes, we immediately find or do some uh, mining of uh, other interesting alleles in the germplasm uh, collections. Great, thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, we, hopefully we get a chance to talk a bit more about that soon. So as you people may have noticed, we've been going in a clockwise fashion, starting from Harris down south, and then we're going final talk now to the furthest north, furthest speaker north in the group, and that is Professor Jerome Hui, who was one of the moderators from earlier on. And Jerome is a associate professor at Chinese University of Hong Kong, where he's the director of multiple life science programs. He's very busy. And he received his DPhil from Oxford, uh, University of Oxford, and also did a postdoc in Oxford as well as in the University of Manchester before coming back to a CUHK. So looking forward to hearing from you, Jerome, about some uh, invertebrates. Okay. Oh, thank you, Nathan. So, okay. So uh, thank you, I mean, for, for, for giving me a chance to give the talk. I mean, so um, the situation in Hong Kong academia is that many people are actually working on their own groups of uh, organisms. So uh, what I'm trying to do in this talk, I'm trying to give you three stories uh, on the different approach of uh, how we do genomics. So the genomes are coming from the night areas, including jellyfish, and also the non-insect apples, like the millipedes, millipedes and centipedes, and also the calisaries, horseshoe crabs. So the first example I would like to share with you is the cnidarians, is the jellyfish. In this case, what we are trying to do is to look for the unexpected findings, okay? So we're trying to look at the genome architecture in addition to sequencing the genomes. So the two jellyfish that we have sequenced are the Sandaria melanensis and also the edible jellyfish. Of course, I mean, in Chinese cuisine, the people will eat jellyfish. The way to which we do the uh, sequencing well, is the chromosomal scale level. We use Illumina, PEPBAL, and also the dovetail high c you know, to do the scaffolding. Um, the, the story has been published. I mean, I'm not going to talk about too much, but I want to focus on four points. I mean, you have uh, homeobos genes. You find unexpected findings like juvenile hormone that is only supposed to be in arthropods in insects, but you find that in the cnidarians for the first time. And the NUMs, which are the nuclear insertion for the genes coming from the mitochondria, uh, people previously think that the linear mitochondria DNA and, and the um, amount for the insertion for the mitochondria genes will be proportional. And we find that this is not the case. And we also work on the small RNAs, find that PVRNAs are also in the somatic cells, for example. So if you're interested, you can further look into the, um, into the uh, reference paper that I've shown below. The first situation is about finding the unexpected. And the second case that I'm now showing you is about slightly different. In Hong Kong, we are not very sure about what are the soil biodiversity we have. So we start with a citizen science project. The citizen science project that we have is, of course, uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong is leading. And we work together with the NGOs and the secondary school students. So they, they will go weekly outside to the field in order to take into the soil and find, reveal what are the soil biodiversity that we have in Hong Kong. After that, we found that the millipedes are actually undersampled and in the world that they don't have a millipede genomes being sequenced. So we sequenced two millipede genomes, the orange rosary millipede and also the rusty millipede. This becomes the first two millipede genomes in the world that we have sequenced. And if you look in the, the phylogenetic tree that's shown in panel A, so millipedes and centipedes are, the, are one of the major group that is the closest cell group to insects and crustaceans. So from there, we have found many unique adaptations inside the genomic features. For example, like small RNAs, the osati glands, which is unique in millipedes, to which they will be useful for chemical defense, as well as for um, antimicrobial activities. So this is what we can also learn from the unique adaptations from the evolution point of view from a citizen science project going into the evolution and trying to reveal what is inside the genome. 
The third case I want to show you is also slightly different. This is about the horseshoe crabs. There remains only four species of horseshoe crabs in the world, three in Asia, one in the United States. Hong Kong is very unique and are lucky to have two species of horseshoe crabs, the mangrove horseshoe crab, and then so the endangered trispine horseshoe crab. What we have done are two things. I mean, first of all, of course, uh, we also do by Illumina Papa and Dr. High C to do our uh, two chromosomal scale level of genomes. We found two very interesting things from the evolution point of view. We found there are three rounds of whole genome duplication happened in the ancestor of, in, of the uh, horseshoe crabs. This is very special in a to which uh, whole genome duplication are usually known to be invertebrates. But we found that the ancestor of horseshoe crabs also have uh, three rounds of whole genome duplication. And the other thing is that we have also done conservation of population genomics. We have collected horseshoe crabs coming from different Asia countries and built a phylogenomic tree as shown in the diagram here in panel B. So we found that actually in different places, including Hong Kong, India, Malaysia, or Thailand, we have distinct populations such that in a way, if we try to need to do the conservation of them, especially for the trispine horseshoe crab, which is the endangered species, we need collaboration, not only within the region, I mean, but we need to also do across the countries in order to know, to know because the horseshoe crab will swim across the border. So we need to do conservation together and that can be done based on population genomics in order to find unique um, populations. So I also want to update you the situation in Hong Kong in the academia. So of course, as I've mentioned at the beginning, many of us have been working on our own groups of interest of organisms, but we collaboratively, we have applied for a funding grant for the equipment. And very luckily, we have been funded by the Hong Kong Research Grant Council, collaborative research grant. So we have obtained the PEPAL CPO2E, so, uh, which is already uh, installed in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. This is an effort that has been done by all eight public universities in Hong Kong. So we are now will be also able to do the sequencing. So referring to the opportunities, challenges, and the way to move forward for, for this region. So I think in terms of um, opportunities, uh, we, we can do sequencing. We can analyze eukaryotic genomes in this region of Earth, which is the good thing. But I think there are also challenges that, that we are facing. The first one is about the public understanding. So um, I think in Hong Kong, many people in, understand the importance for biodiversity, but probably they don't understand what is the reason that we need to do genomics behind biodiversity. So why do we need to do biodiversity genomics? This is one major question that we are facing. And because of that, that is also linking to my next point which is about the funding. So we will be able to do individual group effort to try to sequence certain group, but we won't be able to do a very big collaborative effort, or maybe we need to. This is maybe we can leave for discussion for um, um, sequencing all eukaryotes, for example. I mean, uh, this is something that needs to be, uh, this is the major challenge that I see. So with that, I, I'd like to thank the organizer, Amy, Brooke, Christina, Nathan, and Tina, my collaborators, Alexander, uh, David, Peter, and William, and of course, the funding for, for funding the research that I, I've been showing you previously. So um, that's for what I want to share today, and I'm welcome to, I'm uh, happy to take questions. Okay. Thanks so much, Jerome. Well, ahead of time. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you put a lot of uh, excellent information in there. Some beautiful discoveries based on those uh, weird organism genomes that you uh, have sequenced. Do we have any questions for Jerome before we move over to the panel discussion? I see, I see a question from Andrew. So he asked about jellyfish genome. It's a highly variable within individuals and among individuals. Over time, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Indeed, it is. I mean, uh, so I think there's another another paper in Nature Ecology and Evolution that people show that even the same species collected in different places, uh, there are lots of variation. You're absolutely right. Okay. Great, thanks, Jerome. So I think we've got, we've got about 13 minutes left before we need to let people go. Uh, <laughs> so, we're going to 
kick off. Kick off this discussion. Now, there was one question during Harris's uh, talk that I think both Harris and maybe a number of our speakers can address, and, and that was, uh, may I ask how you will be able to use the information in the sequence genome in conservation? So one of our uh, attendees was interested in, in that question. Can someone I think say Carolyn's the best person to answer that question. <laughs> Sorry, no, she's I was, still here. Yeah, I'm still yeah. here. I um, I vague that because I said Harris had a question, so I was like, oh, Harris. Can uh, sorry, that. Carolyn. I think you, you, <laughs> you already covered it pretty well, but I think uh, one of our attendees wanted to know how we can use genomic information to aid conservation. Uh, yeah, so, so um, I've been famous for always saying that just having a reference genome doesn't actually do anything for conservation, but um, having a reference genome allows you to develop a, a massive suite of tools that you can use for conservation. So whether it's population genetics, just looking at, at neutral genes, um, moving more and more into the future, we understand that functional genomics and understanding what genes are actually um, under selection and, and have potential adaptive potential is highly important and you can't do functional genomics without a reference genome. So that's where it really will come to the fore. And some of the data that different people have shown today where you can look at runs of homozygosity, um, particularly in threatened species, that's, that's something you can only do if you have whole genome data. So those are some of the tools. Also, anything to do with eDNA or metagenomics requires a reference genome. So. Yes, absolutely. Okay, now I was going to put up, uh, Herawati put a nice slide and I actually screenshotted it while she was talking and uh, on the challenges and solutions we are facing as a, a region. Um, can I share that? Now, so yeah, I wanted to ask Harris, so you, it seems like the EBP is doing really well. You've uh, linked up with uh, universities and research organizations all over the world. Can you tell us about how, how do you make it work? How, how can we get those connections uh, happening efficiently and, and, and working? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Hmm. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, Nathan. So uh, the reason why we actually um, successful in terms of attracting um, people first in Jakarta, first of course in Jakarta, and then later on uh, because of the recognition then uh, from over the world. But the reason why we have that kind of a unit or lab is because we are working with wildlife forensics. And to be able to do statistical analysis for all of this forensic, of course, we, we need to uh, develop population database. So that was actually the reason why we uh, go through that. And uh, Ministry for uh, Environment also uh, interested on what the forensics, because as uh, you know, illegal trading is very, very high in the country more than the drug itself. Then uh, because of that, uh, mostly the, all of the endangered species will be sent to our institute. But we need from them all of the uh, database and other samples to be able actually to, to make a database for them. So that's, that's the reason I think why people so your, your institute, it's basically an institute for human genomics, but you're starting to bring in lots of other animals, and that's very yeah. good. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, Harris, I also was interested in, in your uh, viewpoint on, on how to best collaborate with, with different organizations. Uh, yeah. yeah, so so the the EBP is, is running very smoothly and is now... Uh, through all its committee structures, a very uh, well-oiled machine for communication and collaboration. Um, and so it's quite simple uh, now at this point to, to join EBP. There's a memorandum of understanding, as I said, that's been signed by 43 institutions. Project can join without any really, uh, uh, nothing more than, uh, you know, having a, a large scale project. 
uh, that they're doing, which could involve, you know, multiple species across different taxa or um, uh, many species within a single taxonomic group. So that's uh, quite straightforward. And then one of the, the real benefits of, of joining is uh, the regular meetings that EBP working groups and committees have. Um, as I mentioned before, there are working groups on uh, assembly, uh, sequencing and assembly. Uh, there are working groups on sample, you know, acquisition uh, and, um, you know, many of uh, different types of species. Uh, the DNA isolation is an art, you know, <laughs> still, uh, especially for different species of plants. So there's a lot of information sharing that's very helpful to many groups. Um, and, and so again, these, uh, there are five different subcommittees dealing with technical issues. There's also the uh, committees dealing with ethical, legal, and social issues and diversity issues. And so there's really a place for everyone uh, to participate. And, um, and uh, you know, we welcome that participation and uh, we can get you the information uh, required if you just go ahead and send me an email and uh, I'd be happy to. Great, Kathy. Uh, that'd be respond. fantastic. Yeah, I'm interested in, in uh, talking to you indeed. Kathy, you've got a question? More a comment oh, okay. um, than a question. Um, yeah, for those of you who are thinking about joining Earth via Genomes, I definitely think you should. Um, you know, we're a member as the University of Sydney and, you know, we really enjoy our interactions with the community that Harris has built. Um, but I guess my comment um, as an APRU member and as one of the university leaders on the APRU um, groups, is that you know APRU is an uh, is a group of sixty research intensive universities in the Pacific Rim, and we'd be really keen to think about how we can utilize this network to progress our work on biodiversity. And I guess I'd be interested in hearing from people in this group. We're, we've touched on a lot of different things that we could do, but really we're interested in, you know, where should we focus to start off with? I think, um, you know, it's definitely worth joining Earth Biogenome, so go ahead and do that. But also let's think about what we could do as a group of universities. Is it something around training? Because of course, we're all very much involved in training our students. Is it about sharing resources? Is it about joining together to apply for larger pots of funding? You know, that's what I'm hoping that we might be able to discuss, given that we've only got a few minutes left. Um, and I know that Nathan and Jerome are, you know, going to be driving this, but Joanna and I are both here as well, representing universities through APRU. Joanna, of course, is the provost at UC Davis. So if we can help in any way in coordinating at a more senior level at your universities, also let us know, because I think this is a chance for the university leadership to sort of step in and, you know, help us to build this big consortium around the Pacific Rim, which of course is where all the fantastic wildlife is. Yeah, Suba, you wanted to comment on that? Uh, hi, Nathan. Uh, thanks, Kathy, for, for uh, initiating the discussion. I think uh, from a Malaysia uh, point of view is uh, we're having uh, problems in at the moment sustaining our our PhD students who who have, when they graduate they they don't know what to do, especially the ones who actually love biodiversity research, and uh, we have problems on getting them engaged in projects. So uh, hoping that uh, they can actually be trained and improve because we like like me I receive a funding on. E meta uh, eDNA uh, projects for conservation, and my five of my PhD students are already finished. And if I want to put them into my postdoctoral, the 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 funding doesn't allow that. The funding just allows for consumables. So these are the challenges that I face because I was uh, that uh, that is what I'm trying to understand. Where 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 how are we going to bridge this opportunity for uh, current uh, PhD students who have graduated 
and also the, the ones that we want to train. And uh, we have uh, limited funding in a sense that we have money for consumables, but we don't have the people. Yes, I actually wanted to ask Matt Harris about this as well. So there's obviously very large philanthropic uh, funding now for the, like the Bill Gates Foundation, very focused on uh, human uh, suffering, which it should. But can you see in the future more philanthropic funding coming through for biodiversity and, and saving it? Or is it happening pretty Important slowly? Important question, Nathan. Absolutely. And it's already coming. I mean, the first um, big funding actually came from a foundation from the Welcome Trust to, you know, to the Sanger. Uh, that's, uh, you know, in the order of 50 or 60 million dollars. So that was uh, really big. Uh, we're talking to several foundations now in the United States. We got very close a few times, so it was probably early, but now uh, the project has matured and people believe that it's it's real and that it's doable. So um, we're talking to several big foundations and I think it's the foundations that are much more nimble, really, <laughs> than the national funding agencies, which have many more restrictions uh, on how funding is used. So we're we're really pushing that because that will push integration more, that will push the international collaborations much, much more uh, and, uh, and enable those to occur with fewer bureaucratic issues. <laughs> and will allow capacity building because, you know, we didn't even get to talk about it, Nathan, but, you know, one of the big, well, I would say the 600, 800 pound gorilla is Nagoya. And so to, to deal with Nagoya, we're really trying to obtain funding to build capacity in, in biodiverse countries uh, such that the biodiversity, you know, that, that well, the, when the funding uh, comes to those uh, countries and institutions for capacity building, that would be a kind of uh, you know, would fall under the kind of scheme uh, that Nagoya, we, we think is moving forward with Nagoya, where that's a kind of benefit sharing, right? Where, where building capacity is a benefit, way of, build, uh, of benefit sharing. And so I, I think building capacity uh, is a way to get access. Without access, there's no benefits. Without benefits, there's no access. So this is our our one of our number one priorities. And I think foundations will have a critical role to play. These foundations are not just in the United States. You know, China has some very big uh, funding. Europe has big funding uh, through foundations. And we need to coordinate the activities of these different uh, foundations, many of which have different interests. You know, some are interested in the climate issue. Others are interested in the human health and the pandemic. Or it's other interested in, in bioeconomy. So how do you coordinate these so that different parts fit the different funding priorities of the different foundations? And each foundation wants to get recognition, you know, <laughs> and priority for the funding that it provides to the project. So um, uh, all those are complicated issues, but I think we're making a lot of progress. And uh, the Welcome Trust as being the first in is, is willing to convene actually a large uh, meeting of funders from around the world, philanthropic uh, funders from around the world. So we hope uh, when the pandemic now subsides that we'll be able to really uh, move forward on this issue of coordination of foundation funding at the international level, uh, you know, brokered by big uh, philanthropy such as the Welcome Trust. That's really encouraging to hear, Harrison. Perhaps APRU can, or the, we can uh, start something together to perhaps supply and uh, build capacity, as you say. Yeah, building capacity. And you also obviously have great projects that are already going across many different taxa, uh, some with conservation focus, other dealing with groups, uh, you know, mirapods and arthropods, really across the uh, eukaryotic 
uh, you know, uh, tree of life. And all of this, you know, could be potentially integrated into one big project, or it can be pieced out into different, you know, agricultural issues and, uh, and uh, other uh, sort of applications and conservation and, and such. So it's really just people finding each other within the network. That's where I think the APRU is so powerful, all these very good research uh, institutions. And I think the APRU needs to convene. Um, you know, this was a great start and you have a tremendous attendance. You had like 70 people uh, attending. And, uh, you know, now I think all the connections need to be made between these different groups to, to find areas of common interest and, uh, and then begin to move forward on, on you know, regional projects as well as, you know, considering Asia Pacific as one, one big region, what can we do together? And that requires brainstorming, that requires people getting together and laying out some ideas on the table. So to address Kathy's question, I think that is the next step. Now we know, you know, who's doing what, it was, this was extremely important. There are many people um, I, I got to know for the first time. And I think it would be important to convene uh, another meeting, uh, sort of a brainstorming meeting where um, some of these ideas can be put on the table and, uh, you know, to have people start talking about joint proposals and where they might, how they might be funded. Absolutely, yes. Jerome and I and Christina and Brooke, we will, we will get on the case. That's extremely good uh, advice. We appreciate that, Harris. Yeah. Sure. Now, Jerome, I, I should let you uh, speak for a while. Yeah, no, okay. I mean, uh, I think you've been doing a good job. I mean, I think uh, I've seen also other questions that people are in the chat box or other people post at me, which is about, should we be identifying projects and then use uh, jointly supervised PhD students, for example, I mean, across the country. So in that case, different groups can then be integrating and working on the same project. So that may be a way in addition to build at the same time, it will also allows the younger generation to, to get nurtured. So, uh, but of course, I mean, that, that is something that people like Kathy can be able to do at the higher administration level, but that is about us. Uh, but, but this is something that uh, some people have talked about. And also people ask about whether there's interest in uh, sharing expertise or equipment or reagents and resources. I mean, for me, I think that is absolutely fine, but, uh, but, but how to do that together? I think we need to find a way. I mean, that probably we need to form another working group, I mean, later to talk about projects and also the workflow, I mean, or whether we need to have uh, other extra workshops like our informatics training workshop or et cetera, and how to engage. I, I think one way that I still find is important is not just engaging the, the government, I mean, within locally, but we how to cross, I mean, from one country to another, and I think, that is the really the importance of this APRU, not only trying to do within your own region, but how to cross networking between countries. So this is, I think is the strength of this network, but I don't know how to explore, which we need to explore further. So if I can make a suggestion, I think the first step is anyone who's interested in joining this group should let us know. Um, and then there'll be a series of workshops over the coming period. Generally, you know, if we can form a strategic project under APRU, they would have a face-to-face -face meeting annually, multiple mm -hmm. online events. So I think we can develop a really exciting program. Um, but the first step is finding out whether there's interest from the group in having a group that focuses on biodiversity. And if there is interest, um, getting your ideas about who we should sign up at your universities and whether you have collaborators at other partner APRU universities who we should be reaching out to as well. And if I just may, may add up that maybe it will be useful if each university appoints a point person, uh, because ultimately these kind of projects run when there is a person to whom information goes, who is kind of in charge, who builds the relationship linkages, watches where the funding opportunities come and so forth. So I think that that might be really useful, at least from my experiences working with APRU, um, the projects that do have 
the kind of a core group uh, with the representative actually works very, very well and they are very successful in, uh, in accomplishing the goals that are set up. Right, okay. So I think the obvious next step that we are going to do is that we should probably send out an email to all the participants and uh, as well as inviting people to, to see whether they are interested and as well as whether it will be dividing into different working groups and then we'll see and talk. I mean, I think Kefi has, the, has a very good suggestion that we should follow. And Nathan, more what, is there anything else that you want to talk about or? Yeah, it'd be great to talk for another half an hour, but we should probably let it, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or, 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 I think we should let some people go to yeah. sleep or sure. eat the food or something. <laughs> okay, so so with that, then probably we, we should end. I think it's a, it's a very good uh, initiative by the University of Sydney and so by the Chinese University of Hong Kong, of course, the APRU for making all this possible. So again, I thank uh, all the participants as well as Nathan and also Christina, I mean, Amy and Brooke. Uh, so uh, well, hope we will see you again very soon and working together, you know, to solve biodiversity issues to get using biodiversity genomics. Okay, thank you everyone. Before, before uh, we go, day. before we go, yeah. everybody, uh, could we just get a, a group photo? Would ah, you mind if sorry. everybody just, so, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna take a couple of photos and if you wouldn't mind um, putting your best foot forward, <laughs> a big cheers. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank so, you, everyone. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. See you next Thanks time. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. See thank you later. You. Thank you. Congratulations, and and uh, talk to you all soon. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, APRU. Thank you, uh, yeah, CUHK. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs>